Sometimes you just want to recreate that classic sampled feel right inside your door. But unless you understand the way the old school workflow worked, you won't be able to get close. So here are nine steps I used to make any instrument or sound feel sampled. If you love old school analog type sounds, make sure to grab our free analog sample pack below. It's a great companion to this video because it gives you some great source material to work with, but they also just have great recordings from a bunch of different analog synths. So grab that down below and let's get into it. So I just want to show you the example Deep House track that I'm working on. You'll notice the first eight bars sounds nice, but then this lovely piano comes in in the next eight bars. And that's what I want to use in this video as my example to show you how you can make anything sound sampled and really just old school and nice. So let's give our example a listen. So it's quite a nice sounding track, right? You hear that piano, feels like it works melodically and harmonically with the track, but aesthetically, I feel like there's a lot of stuff we could do to it to make it that nice groovy, old school sampled feel, kind of like we've grabbed an old school jazz piano and chucked it over the top of our track. Now, the first thing you need to think of when you're doing this sampled process is that you need to think of the process. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, if you're trying to make something sound sampled, you need to think of the start to finish signal chain or process that you're going to take it through. Now, if we think of an old school sampling workflow, uh, you know, you might get a record from a vinyl player and you would sample that into a 12 bit old school sampler as a long stretch of audio. And then you would then pitch it up, pitch it down, whatever you want to do to that, make it in the key of your song. Then you would chop it up at different points and each part of that leaves a sonic imprint on the sound. So then how does that apply in the door? Well, for example, if we want to make it sound sampled like a vinyl record, then we would need to make the original audio sound like a vinyl record. So think of that in your processing. Do that before you bounce it to audio, chop it up as if you were sampling it, right? Now to keep that in mind as we go through the next nine steps here, but the next thing, number two, would be to get gritty with some bit crushing and down sampling. Now I've got the piano already kind of affected and mixed the way roughly I would like it to sound. Obviously I can do more once it's sampled. However, first thing we wanna do is make it sound like it's gonna have this gritty old school feel. Now there's a few tools you can use if you're in Ableton or a similar door that has a bit crusher. Uh, for example, Ableton's Redux is a good tool. You can use this tool to make it kind of sound that digital kind of grittiness that is reminiscent of old school samplers, like so. And you can also use the filters here to make it a bit more pleasant sounding and less harsh. You can also make it 12 bit just to add that 12 bit feel to it furthermore accentuate the sampled effect. But my personal tool of choice when it comes to this is there's a tool called RX950, uh, which is a great plugin that actually sounds a bit cleaner, but still a bit gritty. The problem with Redux is it's quite an overt, obvious type of bit crushing, whereas this one's a bit more subtle. And the way I use this one is you just chuck it on and you bring down the filter and the audio bandwidth accordingly. You can also bring the gain in to kind of change the way it reacts to this like conversion process. You can see it kind of almost feels a bit compressed as I drive it in there too, which can be sort of a side effect of bit crushing. Uh, play around with these a bit more. Then you've got this option of adding a mono version, which a lot of old school samplers didn't sample both the left and the right. They only sampled either the left or either the right. So you can mimic that by clicking this.
and that's going to give it a really particular feel. Uh, personally, I'm not going to do that because I like to keep some of the stereo width in and I can control it a bit later. But this is my tool of choice when it comes to adding a bit more of that subtle sort of effect. The next thing, number three, would be to add a bit of either vinyl, VHS, or kind of tape warp effects. Now, I would do this again before the sampling effects because we want to think that's part of the medium. So we want it to sound like it's coming from a vinyl record. So a great plugin for this is Isotopes Vinyl. I think it hasn't been updated in a while, but it still works for me. And I like this one, not only because it uh, is meant to exactly emulate a vinyl record as close as possible, uh, but because it's got a great feature set. I, for example, really love to just crank up the warp depth here. You can also drive the input gain in and compensate with some output gain. Add a bit of wear to add a bit of distortion and crunch. Some noise as well if you're into that, although I tend not to. Change the warp model. Add the RPM, how fast the warping happens. And the year kind of reflects the quality of the vinyl record, mostly in regards to the frequency response. And basically, I feel like it adds a high pass and low pass filter, depending on the year you choose here. There's also other plugins such as Retrocolor RC20, which is a similar effect. Let's put this before. And this also has a wobble effect, a magnetic effect. You can choose a few presets here that sound like different mediums. I kind of recommend playing around with these and making it suit your sound because a lot of the presets can be a bit over the top. So have a play around with whatever plugin that adds a bit of wobble. You could even just do it in Ableton if you're like a stock Ableton person with the uh, new Chorus Ensemble has a new vibrato setting. You could add some vibrato there. Obviously very subtle amounts. So you can achieve this vibrato tape effect in a number of different ways. However, let's go over to number four, which is to cut the air and the meat out of the sounds. Now, a lot of old school samples didn't have a full spectrum frequency response like a lot of the modern sounds we have in our doors today. A lot of the time the low end was cut, the high end was cut, and it was almost like this semi band passed feel to things. Now inside the Isotope uh, vinyl plugin, there's this year setting, which I was playing with earlier, which kind of characterizes the sound based on the year the record was coming from, which basically acts as filters. But you can achieve this in a more manual way if you add up your favorite EQ plugin. I'm just gonna use EQ8 here as an example and kind of bring on two filters that are deliberately placed just so you get the right EQ response out of your sound. Uh, again, I like to do this before any sort of bit crushing or stuff like that, but you can do this at whatever point in the signal chain you like. And sometimes the steeper filters sound good for this kind of effect because they're quite, well, they're quite resonant and they give it a certain characteristic that the more gentle ones don't. Now, I don't want to cut it too brutally. I don't want to take all the highs out either. So I'll take out a bit of that air, like around there. It just gives it a bit of a like lower quality sort of feel, uh, which is the sampled feel we're going for, right? So that's a great way just to cut the meat out of the sounds. It just sounds a bit more controlled, narrower, and better for the result we're going for, for that sampled feel. The number five is once you've processed everything the way you like it on the front end of the sound, is to work in audio and not MIDI. Now there's a certain point at which working in audio just makes sense for the sampled feel. I can have more flexibility with the notes I've chosen, which is great while working in MIDI, but at a certain point, if I want to really mimic the way it was working with the old school workflow, I have to use audio. And so I have to commit to the notes and just commit to the idea I've got. Now, what I'm gonna do is create a new channel here. I'm gonna call it resampled audio, resampled piano rather. I'm gonna color it sort of similarly. I'm gonna set the input of this channel to resampling in Ableton because I do have some reverb that's being sent on the piano here in addition to some reverb on the actual plugin here, 
which is a Spitfire upright piano, which is a native Ableton device. Really cool if you're interested in finding a good piano for Ableton. Very short reverb on the piano here, but a longer, more chorusy one from Valhalla Vintage Verb on the send here. Just adding a bit of space and natural kind of vibe to the piano. But again, I want it to sound like a real mixed uh, stem that I can then resample and use and chop up, right? So I'm gonna go ahead here. I'm gonna make sure my upright piano is soloed and I'm just gonna record. Beautiful, right? So we've got a full nice piano stem. Now we can just turn our original one off there. Let's just uh, tuck it away so we don't have to worry about it. Delete these deactivated clips and the extra little recording there. And now this is what we're working with, right? If I was to bring in a sample of a piano, this is what it would sound like. Now the next fun thing you can do, depending on the type of sample you use, is to re-pitch and work with the result. Now, what I mean by repitch and work with the result is I just, as you notice, turned off warping. And turning off warping is great when working with repitching because we're gonna try and get this audio into our key, even though currently it is in our key, but we're gonna make it work in a different way. But that will inadvertently change the timing of the sample. Now, a lot of the coolness and vibe that came from old school samples is the fact that when you pitch the sample up or down, you couldn't really unlink that from the timing like you can in the modern door. So we're gonna go up or down by a fifth or a fourth of thereabout, because that will probably work with the same key that we've already got for this track and see if this new timing and results kind of make something vibey and cool. Uh, it's just a fun process to try. So let's just go, I'm gonna go down five and see what happens and play it with the rest of the track. Okay, already noticing that not working. Let's try up five. Okay. Something's kind of working there. I may actually want to go and mix that differently later. I'm just gonna turn off this chord for now so we don't hear the delay tail. See how some of those notes feel a little timed off and it, it doesn't, it works, but it also doesn't work in the same way. That's the beauty of sampling. I'm gonna go down seven because that's the, an octave down of this new version and see how that sounds. And maybe just go down to negative 12, which is down 12 from the original pitch. Now, bear in mind, we could leave the original uh, pitch for most of it. And then once we start to chop things up, we can then experiment and explore repitching certain slices, which is sometimes a cool way to get that similar effect without going too messy. Uh, but just wanted to show you that it's a really fun thing and sometimes you can get cool unexpected results. So we might work with that a little bit later, but for now, the next thing I wanna show you is the wrong start time. This whole concept of the wrong start time is like, a bit vague, but what I mean by this is when you are kind of slicing and chopping samples on old school samplers, NPCs and that sort of thing, what would happen is the start time might not always be perfect. And it might start partly through the sample or something like that and get a kind of weird wacky result. So what I could do here is I'm just gonna chop my clip into two here. I'm gonna just play around with this first one. Let's just bring down our uh, view here. And I'm just gonna play around with the start time. Right, maybe I'm gonna try a different chop altogether. Maybe I'm gonna bring this back a bit. So notice I'm starting it halfway through this chord here and that kind of gives it a certain slack, sort of random but deliberate feel at the same time. And then maybe I could bring another chop over here, choose another random kind of start time. Maybe pitch this one down.
and then do it again here at the start. And now we're kind of getting a nice phrase. And then we could get this last one, do something really different. So now I've got this cool, interesting phrase, part of it's repitched, not all perfectly on the start times. Maybe this one could even go a bit earlier. So now we get this cool little end bit here too, which is like this little skip of audio. Now we can get the fades and get rid of those clicks, which is a cool convenience of modern DAWs, uh, but it's just a cool effect, right? It's kind of like unexpected happiness, which is uh, awesome. Okay, so number eight is a sudden silence. Now we noticed all the samples I've chopped up here so far kind of all stretch out for the full amount of audio, but that's not how sampling was always done. Often big stretches of silence were a big part of the sound. And that's like any compositional tool, silence is golden, right? So let's see how we can go and add moments of silence into this pattern that we've just chopped up and start to make something a little different. Maybe another little gap at the end here. I like that little gap there. Maybe a little one like this. Maybe you could change the start time of this one. Change the start time of this one, bring it back over here. Maybe this one's a bit long. Those little moments of silence in there though, just make it a bit more groovy, a bit more human feeling. And I really like it. Number nine is the context. Now I've gone ahead and kind of chopped things up considering the context of the rest of our track, but sampling is never done in isolation. Now, sometimes you start a track with a sample and that's fine. That kind of creates the context a lot of the time. But in this case, we're working it into an existing context. So you have to consider what we've done and how that relates to the rhythm of the bass line, to this chord that we had, but we muted for a second. So let's kind of just listen and see what we could change depending on the track. I like this chord here. This, this first pattern is really nice on its own. I, what, what I wanna do is kind of copy part of this chord here, put it here. Uh, allow that little chop of audio there still to come in. And I also want to chop this up here so I want to copy this part over the beginning here. I like this chord and this chord kind of being juxtaposed in the different patterns. And then kind of give it a little bit of a silence gap there. Give this a bit of a silence gap there. And now what I want to do is considering the context, is I just want to add a filter to the whole signal and just really push the piano down into the mix because I want it to be more of a subtle effect, right? Turn it down on the fader. Maybe we could add a final chop at the end here, delay this a little bit, give it a bit of imperfection. Give it a bit of a silence gap there. And then lastly, we can kind of make this last version a pitch down version. And after you followed all of this, 
this is what I got for my example and hopefully you get something cool that's uniquely yours too. So by now, hopefully these nine steps have shown you how to go from a sound or instrument that sounds pretty normal, full quality, get to a really cool result at the end. Now again, if you're after some cool analog style source material for this whole process to apply some of these tips, make sure you grab our analog sample pack down in the description. It's a sample track that I and other EDM prod team members have contributed to just for you guys. And it's a lot of fun. With that, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.